Carruthers. Right, well, thank you very much for inviting me today. And uh, so I'm Judith Carruthers. I'm Development Officer for Heritage Lottery Fund in the South East. And what I'm hopefully just, I'll be as quick as I can do, because you've done a lot of listening this afternoon, and really my main message is, if you've got an idea that you think HLF will fund, please contact me. My job is to support projects up to the point of submission. My business cards are at the back table, so do, do not hesitate and email me if you think you've got an idea. Okay, so there I am. So where the starting point is to think about uh, where the money comes from. It's national lottery players' money. I do really emphasise, please do buy lottery tickets. We need more lottery tickets bought. It'll keep more funding coming to the heritage to help places like the New Forest, to help things like this landscape partnership, which actually embodies everything that we're looking for in an HLF project. And everything I've heard this afternoon, particularly Lawrence's talk just now, about the value of volunteers and projects, that is what HLF projects are all about. Um, so put it into context, in the southeast, this is how big the region is. So we work in regions and we make our decisions in regions. So the New Forest it falls into this region. I spend a lot of my time in priority development areas. These are identified as areas that can have enhanced support by development officers. We're a team of three and these areas that you see up here, there's two in Kent. And the ones nearest to you here are in South East Hampshire, Gosport, Portsmouth and Havant, and coastal West Sussex. What this means is that my colleague, Joe Minden, he comes down very regularly to these areas and he can give more full-on support before people come to assess. It doesn't mean you get more priority assessment, but it means someone such as myself can look at your budgets, can look at your project development. Because what we're looking for are projects that start with grants of £3,000. So we're very interested in community organisations coming to us for funding. Let's um, go back to, again, to make that connection here. Again, this is what today has been all about. We're interested in connecting people to heritage. We're not interested in just restoring heritage for heritage's sake. It's all about how can we make sure that everyone in this country benefits from heritage. And the key thing I always get asked is, what is heritage? And it's how you define it is the answer. We do not define heritage. We just have this loose definition on our website, which says everything tangible and intangible that we've inherited from the past and value enough to want to share and sustain for the future. So that's natural heritage, it's community memories, it's built assets. You define it, whatever you think is significant from the past that needs to be saved for future generations. So what do you need to look at? The first thing to say is you should go straight to our website. All this information is on our website. But the way we do it is through these grant programmes. Now something like Landscape Partnerships comes up over 100,000 into what we call our two round applications and that's where it's much more ambitious. But under 100,000 we try to make it as simple as possible. So our grants start from £3,000 and the smallest grants, we have two grant programmes between three and 10,000. We have Sharing Heritage and we have the First World War then and now. And we try and keep those applications as simple as possible. So Sharing Heritage is an ongoing one. With all these, you're gonna have a heritage focus to start with. You're gonna do a series of activities trying to research, interpret that heritage, and then you're gonna share it with other people. The First World War programme is one that's going to continue until December next year, 2018. And we're particularly looking for applications for this one. At the moment, that's probably our least competitive programme. That and sharing heritage. You do a well-developed project, you've got a very good chance of getting funding for those. Our next one up is our heritage, which is 10,000 to 100,000. And that's where it starts to get more competitive. You've got to remember that you're going to be in competition across the region with museums, archives, landscape partnerships. So you've really got to up your game then. And then we have our Young People's Programme. As, as Lawrence mentioned earlier on, it's more of a struggle to engage young people with many projects. So we're very keen to see a wide range of people engaging. So we have a particular programme with them. And that is a partnership one, where a heritage organisation partners with an organisation who specialises in working with young people. So what do they have all have in common? Those programmes there, under £100,000, there's no application deadline. Just apply when you're ready. It'll then take us up to about 10 weeks to assess. 
You should then, in terms of thinking about your time scale, you should always allow about four months after your submission date for a start of a project. Because even after our assessment process, assuming successful, there's always complications over permissions to start. The length of your projects, if you're going for the under £10,000, they're one year in length. If you're doing our heritage, which is one up to 100,000, it should be up to three years in length. Okay, what's the key points with any of our programmes? Projects with project funder. What does that mean? It's got to have a defined beginning, a defined end. Must have a clear heritage focus. This may sound obvious, but some people don't seem to find that. So that's the starting point. You should be able to articulate with any of your project what the heritage is, what is significant about that heritage, how is it at risk? How will it be lost if you don't do that project? So if you're just doing it about a local village, about the history of that village, what is it that's particularly unique about that, that village? That's what we want to know about. And like all funders, we need to see a well-developed, well-resourced project. So we need to see that you've thought through all the specifics. If you said you're going to do an exhibition, we need to know where is that exhibition going to take place. We need to see what partners you're going to be working with. We need a rough idea of how many volunteers you're going to be recruiting. How are you going to be recruiting those volunteers? So getting all those specifics in place before you put your application in. And then the key thing with our project, we need to see active learning. So we need to see that you've recruited volunteers, that they've been involved in doing some research, in doing learning about heritage and interpretation, they've developed skills. It can't be just about you restoring a church roof and leaving it at that. We want to know how people are given a chance to benefit during your project and not just benefit after your project has ended. Okay, so just to emphasise that, three key elements that pretty much comes on all our projects. Starts with a heritage focus. It then with that, you then have a body of people who do, do activities bringing alive this heritage focus. They're researching it, they're developing a heritage interpretation, and then they're sharing it with a wider public. So, what's our criteria? Well, the way it's done is we have a team of grants officers. So I mentioned that I'm a development officer. There's three development officers in this region. But then grants officers, we have about 10 grants officers. When you submit your project, it's given to one of those grants officers. And they have to write a case paper about it. And the first thing they'll look at is the heritage focus. And they'll give it a score out of high, medium or low. It doesn't have to be of national significance. We just need to see that it's articulated clearly. And we can see that there's, for example, why is it at the risk? Have you put a condition survey? So we can see the, the heritage risk. Have you shown the public themselves see it as heritage benefit? It goes on to this very clear and very important point. What is the need you are responding to? We don't want to see projects that have just come out of someone's head. We need to see the context that your project has come from. So we may see on the heritage side of things, the actual physical side, there's a condition survey. But how do we know that there's a public interest, a public need for your project? What is the consultation that you have done in your local community to show that they are also engaged in this project? You need to have done some kind of straightforward consultation in order to show us that there is a need for this project. OK, and so again, and that fits in, why does it have to go ahead now? Imagine you're in competition with all those other projects across the region. The ones that will stand in most stead are the ones that really show us they have to happen now. That if we don't support that church right now, that roof is going to fall down. So you have to show why it's got to happen now rather than in a year's time. And this is a favourite phrase of ours, value for money. What that really means is we need to see a balance of payments, a balance of costs. If all the costs are going to go on one item, it's going to struggle to look like that is value for money. And it's all about the way we measure it is through our outcomes. And I'm not going to talk about too much about the outcomes here, but it's what you need to look at when you go to our website to find out what our outcomes are. Because you need to show that all your activities, your, your costs, are going towards achieving our outcomes. So it's back to project well planned. And then the sustainability. We don't want to invest money in a project that then there's no legacy after the project. So you need to show us what the legacy is after the project. And as I mentioned there, the tool we use is what we call our outcomes. There are 14 outcomes. We divide them into heritage, people and communities. 
and you can find them on our website. And again, you can always ask me afterwards. They're things like, how will people develop skills? How will people learn about heritage? So here's an example then of a HLF funded project. This is Boxford Archaeology. They received £62,700 in our, our heritage. And they've had a lot of publicity recently because as a, they, they uncovered one of the most significant Roman mosaics in the summer. But again, this had this classic structure, I'd say, to an HLF project. You've got a community organisation leading it, Boxford History Project, another community organisation working in partnership with them, that's the Berkshire Archaeology Research Group, but then they're working with a professional archaeologist group, in this case, Cotswold Archaeology. So, as I said, partnership working is very key to our projects. And then what was the actual activities? Their actual heritage focus was three Roman sites. Test excavations had already taken place, so they could show enough evidence as to there was a need for this project. And they had already recruited volunteers and got the local community engaged in this, so they could demonstrate the need from the public benefit side of things. Then through the project, they recruited 15 core, a, a, a body of 15 volunteers who trained you, learnt skills such as excavation, geophysical survey, service finds analysis and identification. So rather than a professional archaeologist doing all the work, we could see that all these people were going to get trained in a range of heritage skills. The excavation itself took place over two weeks in the three years of the project. There were then community activities so the wider public could find out about it. Open days, lectures, community feedback sessions. And an important thing was that all the research, all the artefacts they find, had a home afterwards through the Boxford Heritage Centre. And that again is an important thing in terms of any archaeology that takes place. Another example of a project, again a classic model of ours. In this case you've got the lead applicant was the Havant Civic Society. Their focus, their heritage focus, was a walled garden that had been closed to the public. It was in a car park, and they, the need it was, there was in poor state of repair and it wasn't open to the public. They got 19,900 from us, and the classic activities they did, they did it in partnership with the Havant Borough Council and Spring Arts and Heritage. In terms of the long-term management and maintenance of their heritage asset, which is something you've always got to consider, they created a friends organisation. Training in the actual project itself was provided by experts, in this case, Hampshire Garden Trust. Various project outputs included interpretation panels and websites, and they made sure there's a promotional campaign so the wider public could find out about their project. And so the long term was this walled garden was enabled to be opened up for the public. And they made sure that it was restored using the appropriate 18th century horticultural examples. Costs, yeah, there's a range of costs you can include. It's worth saying for all those projects under 100,000, you don't need any matched funding. But it's worth saying if you want to be competitive, any funding you can bring to a project will make you more competitive. This should be your next stage. Then if you're interested, go to our website. It can be slightly hard to navigate. But on the top left line there, you see the, the middle one says looking for funding. That is the one to click on, and then you click onto our grant programs to find out more about each of those grants I've mentioned. In each case, there's application guidance for each program, and that is the Bible that you need to read as you do your project, do your application. We have good practice guidance on our websites. They're under a magnifying glass emblem, and they're very useful. So, for example, there's an archaeology good practice guidance there. There's a volunteering one there. And these are my contact details and my colleague as well. But as I said, so any questions, do not hesitate, don't hesitate to email me. At the back table, I've put some leaflets about some of those grant programmes I've mentioned, and I've put my business card there. So please do contact me. Thank you.